Hi, and welcome to the Basic Latina Podcast, an intimate conversation with friends about love, life, wellness, and everything in between. On today's episode, I called in, um, I phoned a friend. Her name is Kim. She's currently getting her PhD at Baron Belt, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. So I apologize if the audio is a little bad. Her and I did a phone conference, and I phoned in Kim because I wanted us to talk about minimalism and some of the benefits and some of the risk factors if you don't put yourself first and put self-care first. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode. So hi, Kim. It is so nice to see you and speak to you. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good, good, good. I'm so happy that you agreed to be on this podcast. This is actually actually different for us because we usually highlight um, black and brown people and like their small businesses and stuff like that are people who are thriving in their field. But I read an article that prompted me to text you um, mm-hmm. about minimalism. So, yeah. and I was like, I don't know anybody else who, who cares about <laughs> minimalism like Kim. <laughs> so do you want to tell me a little bit more um, about what you think like minimalism is? Yes. So going back to January, a friend of mine, Christina, watched a documentary on Netflix called Minimalism. Mm-hmm. Um, raved about it, and I was curious to learn more. So I watched the film, too. And I always understood minimalism to be, like, interior design, like how your space looks, how much clutter you have in your home. But this film really talked more about the values of minimalism, of prioritizing essential things, finding joy, and eliminating things in your life that don't add value. So even though it did situate around space and possessions, it really was a profound message to me about purpose and living and how you um, live your life. Mm -hmm. So I read the book um, and then just kind of began to shift the way I was living. Um, And I also at that same time heard a sermon at the beginning of the year in January and the pastor was asking what nourishes you and what drains you and how you should orient your time and your energy towards things that nourish you and obviously not toward things that drain you. So with this minimalism documentary, the book, and that sermon in mind, I just started to maneuver differently. Um, And I thought about um, what really adds joy to my life, whether it be friends, family, activities, work functions, and making sure that whatever I was doing was adding value. And the things that weren't or that were causing harm or stress or frustration were less um, focused to me at that point. So that was like physical changes. Like I got rid of lots of clothing and just kind of began to live simpler and have less possessions, but also with my schedule. So being particular about the friends I would see, the activities I would engage in, Mm -hmm. and then just about life minimally um, and like really finding purpose and joy in the small things and not having to have most extravagant experiences and the most meaningful days to feel fulfilled um, and just being energized by people and conversations and interactions. So really it's just this big like macro to micro experience of Mm -hmm. my life, my life goals and my life path, but also everyday experiences too that make me feel like I have purpose and value. So I like that because I feel like you addressed everything that I've seen that, you know, minimalism means because Mm -hmm when I actually looked up what minimalism was Mm -hmm. the movie, the book and the two guys who kind of not create, I want I don't want to say that they created the movement, but that kind of made it, yeah, made it popular. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. they have their definition of minimalism is like a whole page long, right? right? Because it could be everything that you just mentioned. It could be that you're decluttering your closet or it could Mm -hmm. be that, you just like simple things or you just mm-hmm. like living a simple lifestyle or mm-hmm. that you declutter the people around you. Mm-hmm. Um, my coworker told me, um, Oh, I'm doing this challenge where I only wear, I only have like 30 pieces of clothing. Is it 30? Yeah. yeah. 30. Yep. And you wear them for three months. I think you like rotate your 30 items. Yeah. Yes. So you have 30 items of clothes and you rotate, rotate them for three months. If you guys don't know what this is, Google it because people do it a lot. So an item of right. clothing could be your pants, a shirt, a scarf, socks. Um, it, it includes everything, accessories too, not just like. Too. But it excludes shoes, right? Yes, right. So basically everything except for shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was like, yeah, my sister and I are doing this. And I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> so- <laughs> 
<laughs> and I was like, you know, the, it's so, you know, it's so funny. And I love this coworker of mine, but she's white. So I was like, yo, white people be doing the most. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, what the fuck? Who does that? But mm-hmm. I was like, whatever. So, um, but at the same time, I'm just like, I don't think I'm going to ever do that. And I'm, I love like challenging myself and I'm such a consumer and such a follower mm-hmm. that I was like, I want to do that. But then mm-hmm. she was like, oh, it came out of, you know, the documentary on Netflix. And I'm like, oh, what, what, what's that commentary? She's like, oh, it's called Minimalism, blah, blah, blah. So I watched it and I actually watched it with my mom. Mm-hmm. So my mom and I randomly watched it one day and it was such a good, like, I don't know if it was like the vibe that we were in, but right. it was so nice seeing these people that like changed their life around. And it mm-hmm. talks so much about the symbolism. Like I, those two mm-hmm. guys, I, I thought that they were hokey a little bit because like, they wore like this like one of the guys always wears the same thing right <laughs> so I was just like oh my god but because I thought that was extreme but what I really enjoy is that they had different people on the documentary talking about yeah. what minimalism means to them and mm-hmm. people that are married and have kids and so my mom and I watched it and we both got out of it is that you have to focus on the things that bring you purpose exactly and that was about it so of course, <laughs> like no, but we got a whole bunch of other stuff, but I feel like that was most important. Um, mm-hmm. So then I, I think I texted you and told you about it. Like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. And I, was already. <laughs> and like, Girl, I already know about it. You late. <laughs> I know. I know. Now tell me how you change your life around, which sounds mm-hmm. like, you know, <laughs> how did you change your lifestyle after you saw yeah. the movie, read the so, book, and heard the sermon? and Yeah. So I think one quick thing that wasn't too drastic was like clothing. I have a lot of clothes and shoes, like yeah. not too many. Um, but I wasn't wearing them. So I kind of began a system of like my closet where if I didn't wear something, it would sit in the back and things I wore would sit in the front so I could get a visual of what I was actually wearing. Yes. And same thing with my shoes. I had a side of shoes in my room that was worn, a side oh. of shoes that wasn't worn. Mm-hmm. So I could see that those shoes never left that side of the room, then you don't need them. Right. And it's hard because you like having options, but just clutter and even in big spaces, it's just, it's like stifling. So I began with that and I didn't do a really big purge until I moved from Boston to go come to Nashville for school. But I slowly began to give things away and I did a huge like giveaway dump at the end uh, in May when I was about to leave. So that was more, that was easier. I have benefited from, I wanted to <laughs> today. <laughs> But it's great. I live in a studio now and I have space. I'm not like drowning in clothes and shoes right. and knickknacks. Like my space is minimal. My furniture is minimal. So that's a wonderful, like relaxing thing. And that's something I've done here too. When I came down for school um, to Vanderbilt, I didn't get a lot of furniture. I have like very basic items. So my house doesn't look empty, but it's not packed with decor and furniture. It's very calm. And for me, it's peaceful to come somewhere where there's like lots of floor space and blank walls. Um, but then with like friendships and time, I just really started thinking about like, everybody's wonderful in my life. They're all great, but some people don't make you feel as like valued or appreciated or affirmed. And people like that, I was just beginning to pull away from slowly. So I didn't like do anything drastic and like tell them or like, we're not friends anymore, but just in my own way, kind of feeling less um, prone to email or text or make time yeah, and really focus on the friends who really nourish me and like energize me. And I think that's what I think about a lot is energy. Like why do you leave certain places feeling bad or sad or upset or some places make you feel happy and excited. So energy is what I look for a lot now. And if energy's off, like I don't go to it, or I don't stay, or I don't engage at all. So that's been a really important aspect of it. Um, and then just thinking about like minimizing my life, like my future, it's just, I just want to make a difference. I don't have to have all the nicest things and be in every article and be in the news to feel important. It's just um, knowing as a person, someone values my contributions, whether it be in a very small way, like a conversation or just a kind word. Um, So just seeing impact as less than this like grand stellar being famous, but really just making small impacts every day. So focusing on relationships and people and making them feel valued is important too. So it's, it's been a process and I feel like I'm glad I began this before I moved down here because starting a PhD program and being, having the wrong definition of success would be very stressful in this environment. For me, success is not publications and fame and academic, you know, 
being a seller. It's really just um, making an impact. And that may be smaller than some people might aspire to, but for me, that's enough. So I think that that's been very important to have that framing starting school. I think you mentioned three things that I want to explore more. So one of them was that you, the most basic um, an easiest way to minim to minimize or to become mm-hmm. a minimalist, right? Is to minimize mm-hmm. your things, um, right. closet and stuff like that, which mm-hmm. I'm going to get into a book that helped me. Yes. And then the second one was looking at your friends, the people around mm-hmm. you to see like, who are you, um, spending your energy on and who's kind mm-hmm. of like spending their energy on you and what kind of energy they have. Mm-hmm. And the third was kind of minimizing your life, not having all these like, grandest goals of like oh I want to like do this Mm -hmm. and do that and be this person Mm -hmm. and be in lights you're just kind of like I just want to make a difference and hopefully I make it until this age and people will remember (laughs) (laughs) kind of being being simple and I think I wanted to do this pot this a particular episode with you just because of the article that I read which I'll get into later but mostly Mm -hmm. because I feel like I keep hearing things about minimalism and people think it's something that only white people do right like people of color right. don't do it but we do mm-hmm. do it it's just not yeah. called minimalism right yeah but, exactly yeah yeah like the the part about the energy right and wanting mm-hmm. to get people out of your life to um you know that's something that's just like generally just like healthy right we right. all go i feel like self-care. <laughs> yeah yeah self-care. exactly uh, a, like form of, a form of self-care is it's kind of reevaluating your life and figuring out, okay, you know, does being around this person stress me out and I leave mm-hmm. tense and anxious mm-hmm. or doing being around these people? Does it make me feel good? And am I going to spend less time with them? So I feel like mm-hmm. it does. That's something that we do unintentionally. Anyway, we're like, you know, I want to be around positive energy. I don't want no one negative around me. So we're already kind of doing that by putting people more purpose, like putting more purpose into our relationships and that, mm-hmm that came out in our relationship when it came to that time that you, you came to my house on a Sunday to watch an award show. <laughs> yeah. and I think that's so cute. It's a cute story. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you. So I didn't know about the purposeful kind of relationships thing until the golden globes came around. I was complaining to Kim and said, Kim, like I want to throw a party, but I feel like, you know, I don't have no one to watch the golden globes with like no one that is obsessed with movies. And you were just like, Oh, I can't make it. You know, I wish I could I have to work tomorrow. And then you were just like, nope, I'm going to come because you're my friend <laughs> and I want to spend time with you. And I was like, that is so nice. <laughs> and it wasn't until, like, I really appreciated you that day. And then it mm-hmm. wasn't until much later that I realized that it was just like a, a lifestyle change for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize until I stopped becoming, I lost those, these two, um, I stopped being friends with these two women last year in December. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like stopped being friends with two particular people that had been in my life for a long time that created a big impact. That was unexpected. I didn't plan that, but mm-hmm. ended up being good for my mental health. Right. It has allowed me to be more intentional about who I pour into mm-hmm. and what kind of energy I have around me. So I feel mm-hmm. like once you start, um, not, I was going to say cutting people off, but that's so mm-hmm. like inappropriate. <laughs> but more <laughs> when you start, um putting yourself first mm-hmm. like once you do it once does don't you feel like it becomes easier exactly. yeah and one of my my friend amber told me this to, about energy like energy is currency mm. and what you spend you want to get in return so if you're expending energy on people or activities or tasks and there's no return you'll be feeling void so when you think about it that way, like you really protect it because currency can run out and it can go bankrupt. <laughs> but if mm-hmm. your energy is spent wisely and it's invested wisely, you should get in return more than you expend. Um, but people just kind of treat their time and effort as if it's going to always be reciprocated. And granted, there's times where you won't get things back, maybe immediately, maybe a longer return. But when you think of it in like a very careful, thoughtful way, you're more deliberate about how you do things because it's a currency it's an exchange that should be happening so no that that that's so true and Mm -hmm. I feel like more of that I've been hearing more of that recently because now I'm in a position where I'm teaching um and this is kind of off subject but you know I'm teaching kids in high schools right now about healthy relationships Mm -hmm. and we're boiling it down to the fact that people are may 
you know, there's different reasons why people are maybe abusive and in a relationship. Mm -hmm. But we know that a lot of what you grew up around is going to affect how you how you react towards your partner and um, what kind of coping skills you have or de-escalation skills. And so we're talking about with males, how they get angry and they don't know how to manage the anger. Mm -hmm. And so we we talk. I talk a lot to my kids about self care and how you can't pour into somebody else's cup if yours is empty. Right. That's like the easiest way for me to tell it to them, and they're just mm -hmm. like, "Mess, that makes so much sense." But it's true. Mm -hmm. How exp how do you expect to be your best for your partner mm -hmm. if you don't take care of yourself? Exactly. And I feel like we spend we will we will like go crazy to be there for people and go to bat for people. But it's like, why do we not, you know, why are we not putting ourselves like first? And I feel like people think that's selfish a little right. bit. And something else I heard recently that's been in the minimalism way is this frame called JOMO. So J O M O and people know FOMO. Okay. But J is for joy. So the joy of missing out. And I feel like one thing I've been trying to do more of is like not feel like I have to be in the mix all the time. I don't have to be at every event. I don't have to go to every dinner. I don't have to be in every conversation. Sometimes there's joy in like being on your own or doing your own thing or finding your own entertainment. But I feel like we're always in a society where we want to be like part of the action, but that's not always enjoyable for one or feasible. So if you can find joy in like your own time, your own way, I think that's really helpful in for me, I, um, at a time, was always trying to have people spend time and come together. But now I'm like, let things happen organically. You know, you can make, put effort forward, but you don't have to force things. But also, like, there's value in just do, like, going your own way sometimes, too, and not having to be in the mix and part of the action always. And it was interesting because I was talking about joy. People can experience joy without you, too. Like, you don't have to be part of something for it to be exciting and you may miss things and that should not be something you regret because people were happy they had a great time you didn't get to participate but it was still a wonderful event <laughs> so can you be happy for other people even though you weren't part of that experience and I think that because we missed stuff we're like oh we're probably whack oh, I'm glad I didn't go like we minimize how, how important it could have been but why can't someone else being benefited from it be enough for you, you know oh yeah like, like being happy for those people who went and being yeah, happy that yeah. you stayed home Exactly. Like you guys had a wonderful time. You're raving about it. I'm not jealous or envious. Like I'm glad you enjoyed yourself and I'm, that's wonderful. And like letting it be that right. and not having to tear it down or minimize how important it was. But I feel like that's part of my minimalist journey too, is just like doing what brings me joy and like not feeling like I have to be part of it all the time, you know? So. I yeah. think that has become more and more challenging as there are more and more apps and ways to connect right. with people and keep up with people are more, they're out there they're at our fingertips all the time. Right. You know, right. I just, you know, I was just recording an episode with one of my guy friends and we were talking about how it's so challenging just like now, cause everything is so accessible and people are so accessible. Yeah. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. We're constantly, right. you, you're someone that barely posts and you might think like, Oh, there's mm -hmm. something, you know, what's wrong with Kim and where's she at? Is she right. sick? And, <laughs> But it's like, just like, no, like Kim is a lurker. She likes to like and like, <laughs> <Right, exactly. laughs> browse, like, social media. <laughs> you browse and that's it. But you don't necessarily feel like you need to post. And I think um, I have to get better at not posting everything. How mm -hmm. I, how I've justified it or um, what I've been kind of trying to do lately is first, since I have this podcast, I feel like now I have to be on social media more. So I have to mm -hmm. be mindful of how much time I'm spending. So right. I already am the kind of person that posts silly stuff on Instagram and Snapchat. Mm -hmm. I don't use Facebook mm -hmm. that much, but I just like posting silly things because I feel like something ridiculous is always happening to me. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> <laughs> and I try to be pretty candid. Like you'll barely see me post like a super filtered makeup selfie, but I'll post me with my, my double chin and my pimples and be like, <laughs> like something crazy. So I feel like I have a, I'm really bad at if I'm depressed or anxious that day mm -hmm. and I see that other people went out that day and looked great and their makeup looked flawless. I'm just like, damn, why wasn't I there? I'm not mad. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, why did Kim get to go? I hope she didn't have fun, but more just like, Oh, why is my life so terrible? And you start kind of bringing yourself down. Right. Right. Yeah. So I'm really trying to think of that, the Jomo and recognize that like, can I find joy in my own way? 
in my own space, on my own, literally sometimes too, and not feel like to feel fulfilled, I have to be at every exciting, enjoyable event people are participating in. So, yeah. Do you feel like, um, a, you know, alone time or being by yourself, is it, does it seem like taboo? Because in, I feel I mean, like- I think it varies. Because I'm not, I don't know if I'm an introvert or extrovert. I don't really know. I never could figure out. So I think introverts, they need a long time to, to be re-energized because they can be social and they do well in social spaces, but it's taxing. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that way. I almost, I'm the opposite where I feel very energized by people and conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like to be alone just to kind of breathe and reflect and, you know, think. So I don't, I don't, I think t- alone time is very critical. I wouldn't say it's taboo. People don't make enough time for it, I believe, but I think certain kinds of people need it for different reasons. And for me, it's just like the relaxation of it is very necessary. Other people kind of need it to be kind of restore themselves for yeah. more social time. But I, I think I, I use taboo inappropriately. I meant like, do you think that it's like, um, like frowned upon or shame to be the girl that's like, goes to the movie by herself and goes to dinner by herself because I can I talk about my personal I don't I don't know I don't think so I think in this now more and more people see the value of that like not always being part of the pack you know some people are very they want to be with their girls 24 7 but I think as a, as we're getting older and like becoming adults people really value themselves like them as individuals and don't feel the need to always be part of a group other people kind of that's how they operate which I get but I'm not one to like go to the movies alone I don't know <laughs> just can't. <laughs> I, 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 hope- I sleep anyway so I'm not even gonna go but I typically don't do things alone I can be in my house alone for I live alone I live alone for many years but um but you don't go to places like, like, yeah yeah I don't really do that <laughs> I get, I'm like I don't <laughs> find more value being home alone and like watching an, a movie or making some food than I would going out by myself. If that makes sense, but I may try it. I'm open to it. So, yeah. I no, I I like that you said um, that people are valuing more time by themselves because I think that's mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope that somehow that trickles up to Connecticut because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm. So still seen as an oddball because I like doing stuff by myself like that's not weird at all to me no and like you say oh you can't go to the movies and stuff by yourself which is fine because a lot of people can't but I do and so my co-workers and everyone that I have around me is loving when they say their stuff but it does affect me in that my co-workers will say like what you doing tonight oh I'm gonna go to the movies I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that yesterday I was meeting with my producer and editor at this like little coffee shop and I said, before she shows up, I'm going to go have dinner and a glass of wine. And my coworker's like, by yourself? I said, yeah, girl, I, I need to like reboot. Like mm-hmm. I'm an extrovert, but like mm-hmm. you said, like I have those, I have to re, I'm not an introvert at all, but I mm-hmm. have to reboot. Like right. I'm always talking to people. I'm always on. Mm-hmm. So most of the time, if I don't have to be with people, I'm by myself. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to sit there and try to text my friends and say, hey, do you want to go to the movies? Do you want to go out to dinner? Because internally, I'm hoping that they'll say no. Right. <laughs> because I don't love them. I don't want to spend time with them, but I have to reboot. Right. And Kim, I've been doing this forever. Like mm-hmm. for as long as I can remember, like just doing stuff by myself and the people around me still, I think is a little weird to them. And I hope that it gets to a point where more women are more vocal about doing things by themselves. And it's not because I feel like it's seen like we're depressed. Like since I'm single, Right. And since I'm a woman of color and I'm, I don't know what it is, but I think it's because I'm single and I'm doing stuff by myself that people think that I'm like sad, that I'm depressed or something like that. No, it has nothing to do with, I, I am depressed and I do have anxiety, but that has nothing to do with that. It has mm-hmm. nothing to do with the fact that I'm single. I just want to be by myself to recharge my battery. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, hope I, that, mm-hmm. I hope that becomes unpopular. I think it's important because you don't want to have to always coordinate friends and times and like schedules. You just want to just go be and enjoy yourself. So I don't think that's a problem at all. Right, right. And I and I do hope it becomes more popular. Um, mm-hmm. Do you feel like you're seeing more people kind of adapting? I want to get into the, the cluttering and stuff, but do you mm-hmm. feel like you see more people of, do you see any people of color kind of adapt to minimalism mm-hmm. in particular? I think it's becoming more popular 
And I was, I wish I could have talked to my friend about this because I mentioned it that I'm becoming a minimalist. He was like, oh, me too. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so did. funny how people talk about it. Like, it's like a religion. Like, oh, we didn't talk about it much, but it was just like this common thread we had. But I, they may not call it minimalism, but I feel like more people are trying to find purpose in what yes. with less. Does that make sense? Yes, I like that you said it like that, that it might not be minimalism, but they just want to declutter and have purpose. Yeah, right. But with less, um, not defining success by like material success or professional success, but just finding purpose in small things. And I think my parents, by like what I define minimalism to be, are minimalists in a way, like the way they raised us, they kind of had us focus on being a person of good character and integrity and having values and not necessarily aspiring to be the most impressive and you know memorable person in terms of how society would see it so I think it's actually not uncommon it's just the way it's kind of been co-opted by people who are like wealthy and white so they the way they frame it is very elite and like unattainable but it doesn't have to be if you um can think about it differently because people talk about minimalism in terms of terms of like possessions so they only have like one organic bamboo toothbrush and it's like okay (laughs) organic bamboo toothbrush or like reusable like thinking about waste and waste production so they'll have like reusable stuff it's more like sustainability like what you describe people conflate them that's what they do they conflate like what it is to be less of a consumer um and consumerism that's not really what drives me behind it because i've never been one to be like much of a consumer anyway again it's more like my values are different. My purpose is different. The way I spend my time. So I think it is not as uncommon as it seems. It's just the language is like, what? <laughs> you know, the language has not gotten to people yet. Because yeah. when I told people about this episode, they were just like, what does that mean? And I'm just like, yeah. living a simple life. Right, like, exactly. You don't have a billion gadgets. And it's mm-hmm. funny because my coworker, her boyfriend is a photographer. And she was just like, I'm like, well, I'm explaining to people what minimalism is. You're just like, oh, I'm a minimalist. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, how are you a minimalist? And they're just mm-hmm. like, I have, I, I, this is simple and that is simple. And I only have mm-hmm. this and I only have that. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, yeah, like more people. Yeah. It's, it's so funny that people think it's like a, something that white rich people do. But it's, actually, like, yeah. it's something like you don't have to be rich. You're actually, it's like mm-hmm. the opposite. Like you right. have barely anything like right. in your home. But I think I remember somebody framing it that way that was like, the problem of minimalism or tiny houses is like, people do it to survive sometimes because that's all they have. And then now people have taken it and made it trendy and fashionable. So that's when they get Oh, yeah. Because it's like some people don't have things, you know? And so for people to take this idea and market it and brand it and make it look, you know, sparkling new, it's frustrating because it doesn't speak to like class issues and race issues. But I think when you look at it the right way, you don't have that problem. But I can see some people resisting it for that reason um so I understand that but I think like you said people are doing it like us as millennials we're we value experiences more than like possessions so we're yes. going on trips we're going to shows and we're not spending money on buying houses and cars and clothes but we want to do things and see friends and like make memories so that's a, that's a minimalist perspective you know in a very like basic sense but yeah Yeah, I think, yeah, I definitely hope that people get out of this is that you're probably already doing it. And I want to get into how is it that people, um, that you're probably already a minimalist, but I definitely wanted to, hold on, wait a minute, because this is acting weird. So back to, I definitely want Kim and I to kind of talk about um, the benefits of minimalism and decluttering. We could call it slash decluttering because minimalism has such a strong connotation to it. And then right. how you might already be a minimalist. But yeah. um, I wanted to co- talk about a few things that kind of brought me to, because um, Kim, you talked about your lifestyle changes, b- being at Vanderbilt and having your own place and being more intentional about finding joy in moments. Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned a little bit about how we watch the same documentary and then uh, we both ha- have the same intentions in terms of relationships. And mm-hmm. I've kind of told my friends that in different ways, you know, that I'm very intentional with my friendships. Like one of my friends, for example, was laughing at me because every time we hang out and they're like, Hey, like, when are we going to have happy hour next? I like pull out my planner and they're just like, Oh my God, I'm there. So you have to pencil me in. And I'm just like, I know that they're joking, but I'm just like, but I do have to pencil you in. Mm-hmm. And not in like you're important to me, 
So Mm -hmm. I have to put you in my planner. Like, just like you and I were meeting today, I put it in my planner. So if Mm -hmm. I, if you tell me, I'm nearest, can we, can I call you tomorrow or can we hang out tomorrow? Um, or whatever the case may be, we have to, I have to check my schedule because I want to make sure that I'm blocking out that time to be with you, see you, and I don't have anybody else to see or whatever the case may be. So I was telling my, so I was telling my friends about that. So I've kind of been telling my friends that, you know, I'm consistent and that I'm always going to check my planner. I'll tell Mm -hmm. you if I'm busy and I'll always reschedule Mm -hmm. if I need to. But then what turned up for me, Kim, was that I read this damn book. Did I tell you about it? The one about the ways to declutter. No, what's it called? Yeah. So the book is called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing. So Mm -hmm. I, like months, months later, after you and I were talking about minimalism and stuff like that, I was like, oh, this makes sense. Like putting purpose into things and not people. And I told myself that I would do that. But in the movie, in the minimalist movie, I didn't like the practices that the two guys were talking about. Mm -hmm. And it didn't click with me like on a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. It was just like, oh, throw this away. This doesn't give me purpose. Oh, throw this away. So I was just like, this is not clicking for me, but I, I get the concept. So I'm on the, I'm listening to a podcast. Um, it's called Another Round. And one of the girls starts talking about decluttering and mental health. They talk about mental health in this whole podcast. So she starts talking about mental health and how decluttering helps her mental health because it makes her, if her space is clear, it makes her mind feel clear. Mm-hmm. So she talks, she starts talking about this book and I'm like, Ooh, like I love getting book recommendations. So I get it from the library. I read it. It's like a, one of those books that you could read kind of like sporadically. Cause it's not, it's something the author who her name is Marie Kondo, I'm probably saying that wrong, but she kind of puts into practice how to declutter your life mm-hmm. and how to put purpose into it more. So I guess in her, in Japan, she goes around and helps people organize their life. Mm -hmm. So people hire her to basically go into their home, go into the, yeah, to go into their home and help and for them to get help from her about, you know, what stuff to put away, how to organize, how to declutter. But, and she talks about that. So she literally tells you about like how to fold, how to clean, um, how to, how to organize your closet, how to organize your home. So it, I learned so many different things in that book and it's so interesting and funny at the same time. Cause I'm just like, this lady's telling me how to fold. That's a bit much. <laughs> like, I'm Puerto Rican. I know how to fold. Like, but I loved it. Cause she talked about like intention and how mm-hmm. to be intentional about your things. Mm-hmm. So she was just like, you know, if you're going to declutter and this is exactly what I did. That's what I'm talking about it. She said, if you're going to declutter, do it when the sun is up and do it mm-hmm. at the moment that you wake up. So you can see all your clothes in the, in the light of day. Mm. And she was like, people, you know, and this is something that I feel like everybody does. You know, people, uh, they'll organize or they're clean with music or with TV or people around. But really, when you're having, um, when you're decluttering and going through your closet, you should really just have the sun pouring in and you be by yourself with your clothes. Wow. And she was like, you should be picking up every single item feeling the fabric, smelling it, like see if it triggers any memories for you and see if it brings you purpose. And if it doesn't, then you can toss it. Wow. I love that. Isn't that so beautiful? So it, the, the book is definitely something different because it's just like, I'm Hispanic. So I play music in the morning, you know, when I clean, <laughs> I'll like randomly start cleaning, like organizing my drawer in the middle of the night. Like, so when she did that, it was, when when I read it and she said those words, I was like, wow, like I've been cleaning so wrong. And so I think that I might've texted you or maybe I put it on social media. Either way, I started decluttering, you know, and for those of you, you guys probably know by now that I live with my mom and stuff. So a lot of my stuff is already like, I'm already a minimalist cause I don't have room for much. And mm-hmm. so I thought that by giving things away, whatever, I had never thought that I, there was like more things for me to like toss. Kim, mm-hmm. eight bags of stuff. Oh. Mind you, I barely, you know me, I'm always complaining I don't got no clothes. <laughs> I'm so serious. I ate bags. 
mm-hmm. of just clothes alone and like four bags of like accessories and just like random stuff. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even like touch like my pictures or nothing like that, but it was basically like the things that did not serve me purpose. You know how good mm-hmm. I felt afterwards? So freeing. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because when I posted about it, a lot of people reached out to me and were like, oh my God, I'm doing the same thing and I'm decluttering and I'm minimizing and I'm not even like patting my own back or nothing, but I had friends reach out to me that I inspired them to like clean and declutter their home because Mm -hmm. I talked so much about the benefits for mental health. And I didn't even know for me, it just benefited my mental health to just be in a space where the things that are around me motivated me and encouraged me and made me feel good. So that's kind of the way that I, um, I kind of implemented it and I still kind of adapted in that, you know, I won't pick up, I literally went to Amazon the other, no, not Amazon. I went to Bed Bath & Beyond the other day to buy something I needed, um, like toiletries or something. And then I picked up a Bluetooth speaker mm-hmm. that was also a diffuser that had lights. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I need this. <laughs> this has lights. It diffuses. I could put my essential oils. I need a Bluetooth speaker. Mm-hmm. Girl, I don't know if I like what got into me, but I bought it and then I went to go out to eat. And I'm just like, why did I get that? <laughs> and I think that happens to a lot of us. We're so yeah. impulsive in so the things that we get. Yes. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I definitely have. I'm better at um putting things down that I don't need and it's always difficult with like decor because I like decor and stuff like that but then what gives me relief is that I'm seeing that having a minimalistic kind of lifestyle having that sleek modern simple Mm -hmm. home is attractive now yes exactly yeah you see it on Pinterest you see it on like bloggers they're like their homes are so beautiful. And for me, when I, I told myself that when I move, I can't wait to just feel my, my house will be so simple and I can't wait to fill it with plants. Like I want to feel like I would live in a jungle. That's what I have now. <laughs> That's the main decor. I have a few paintings, of, but I have mostly plants and it's so calming and lots of sun and plants. It feels very natural. So. Yes. Yeah. So uh, do you feel like you've continued to implement it? Yes. Yeah, so I feel like, um, being able to get rid of a lot of stuff when I move. And I wish I had done what you did with like looking at things as in terms of purpose. But me, it was more like utility. Like if I'm not wearing this, I'm getting rid of it. Mm. Like I said, when I moved, um, I knew I was going to be in a studio. I have space more than most studios, but still you can't have a ton of stuff. So I think that naturally I keep, um, keep shoes. I have clothes. I have plenty of options. Like I haven't worn the same outfit in like three months so I have enough clothes <laughs> that's the thing we have so much more something we actually need or wear that's half the problem but if I can have reduced my wardrobe significantly and still haven't worn the same outfits since August like I'm doing fine mm-hmm. um but like I said in terms of furniture I didn't buy a bunch of decor I just got some really big like a couch bed tv stand I didn't do a lot in terms of decor and it just feels better. Like I come home and I feel peaceful and the, the space is clean. It's less to clean. It's less to maintain. So it just, for me, it works so much better in terms of managing stress and just feeling more at peace in my house. So. Oh, no, that's a, that's a perfect um, transition to this article. But it's funny because you said two things that, um, that I thought of. In the book, the decluttering book, she said that, um, what did she say that you, that you mentioned? Oh, so she this happened to me. I don't know if it happened to you. Did you feel like you decluttered, you changed your lifestyle, but then you find yourself accumulating things all of a sudden and you had to declutter again? Mm, Yeah. I feel like because I was moving, I was able to avoid that. I think if I had decluttered and stayed in the same place, I would have just like been tempted to keep acquiring, but I was going from a two bedroom to a studio. So clearly I had to cut back (laughs) drastically. So I think, um, now I avoid, and I like, I used to shop a little more impulsively. So now when I shop, I look at the item on the hanger for like minutes, like stare at it. Like, do I really want this? What do I have to look at? Like, I, I look at it, you know, as before I would just kind of buy stuff and be done. But I think I keep my possessions down by like thinking about purchases very hard and long before making them. So, yeah. I like that because you kind of went through like a natural transition. So mm-hmm. you had to downsize for, right. for me, what the, um, 
the author said, she said, you know, every six months you should do this ritual mm-hmm. where you're like by yourself in your room with the sunlight and going through your clothes and stuff. And I hadn't done it because I had decluttered one time and then I found myself decluttering again. It was the oddest thing that the first decluttering was like 10 bags. And I had given away a bunch of my stuff on Snapchat. So you don't have Snapchat, but I'll literally do is doing like a giveaway on Snapchat. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I do not. I love my books, girl. I gave away almost all my books. Mm-hmm. I was just like, these are books I'm never going to read. I don't have interest in them anymore. They're just like catching dust. I, I had, I was dropping off books of people in the parking lot of Stop and Shop. Mm-hmm. I was going to people's <laughs> jobs. It was so, and it was people that I knew. So that was, and that's what made me feel good is that they got something in return. Right, exactly. But then what happened, like three, you know what, this happened after. So when you, this is something that people do. So the author said, so you have to do the six month check in with your clothes. Then she said, don't do the thing where if you have a sibling or a friend, you give them all your stuff because mm-hmm. now you're causing them to have clutter in their life interesting so when you get had your when you gave away all your stuff i like grabbed all of it (laughs) and so two i think like a month ago or two months ago my like closet was breaking wow and i was like why is my closet breaking all of a sudden like there's clothes spilling out of it and my shoes don't fit and i have all these decorations and i don't like blame you but it was one of those things where (laughs) like people have been transitioning so much in my life and i've been accumulating their stuff it's so interesting yeah so it's like just like if you had like a sibling then you're like oh girl i don't like this anymore here you can have it Mm -hmm. the author talks about a woman a a old a girl who's probably our age who was giving her little sister all this stuff and her little sister ended up like getting like depressed and anxious because she had all these things that she thought she thought she couldn't say no to Mm -hmm. so i ended up having to declutter a month ago because i felt like i was suffocating in my own space Mm -hmm. And I was getting the itch, like, oh my God, this is what, what am I going to do all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, so I recently decluttered. And another thing that the author mentioned is if you live at home, it can be an issue because you're going to want to declutter like the whole house, but you can't, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you can't, you have to fight the urge to throw away your, your, your family's stuff. Mm-hmm. Girl, I am just waiting for the day for my mom to allow, to allow me to go in that basement and clean it. <laughs> And go crazy i know but there is a benefit it's easier to be a minimalist like when you're single because if you're married or have a partner and they aren't with the wave like you can't force it on them either so it is a very individual experience but i would hope that like people who you love can kind of come on board eventually too so yeah that's that I, I like that you said that because it's it's important to know that you can't force other people into this lifestyle mm-hmm. exactly it's very it's very indiv- individualistic mm-hmm. um so this article so i texted kim i think it was late at night and was like we have to do a minimalism episode and she's like okay so mm-hmm. i get the psychology today it comes every month so for october 2017 they had an article about clutter control and it's a very short article. And so they're talking about, um, it's mostly talking about workspaces, but they talk about how, you know, have you ever looked around your home or office and realized like, how, how did you accumulate all these knickknacks? And they talk about like overflow in your inbox, um, and how clutter can, um, let me see how basically clutter can cause this stress. Um, it affects life satisfaction, physical health and cognitive understanding. So it says that when clutter becomes uncontrollable, it can be a symptom of hoarding, which I know that, you know, that's like a real, like a DSM diagnosis. So I don't want to say that anybody's a hoarder, but there are plenty of people who aren't hoarders, but they just collect things because it makes them feel better. Mm. So I, they did a study, um, to kind of figure out why people are struggling so much and why they're accumulating things and how it affects your mental health. So one of the things, so they kind of, they realize in the study that people are accumulating things or hoarding things because they want to save it for a different time period. They think that they need it, um, but that these people were reporting greater stress, negative emotions, Mm -hmm. 
um, they were more irritable, less disciplined, and more sad. And so they have here five downsides of cluttering. So five ways that cluttering is bad for you. Wow. Um, so living in disarray impedes, your, impedes you from identifying with your home, which should be a retreat from the outside world and a place of pride. Right. Nothing, that's really true. It's so, that's so true. true, right? Yeah. You know, you should be able to come home and it should be relaxing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having too many things in too small of a space will lead you to feel that your home is your enemy, not your friend. Mm -hmm. Isn't and I think that was my issue in the studio. I lived in Boston. I had too much stuff. Like I had stuff in like a outdoor box on my patio. I had stuff in book closets. It was like overflowing and it was stressful <laughs> trying to get to suitcases. And I, I would purge like every two, three months, but it was too much still for the space I was in. So this time I made the effort to make sure my studio felt manageable. So that's that's good i'm glad that you had that awakening because a lot of people don't get a chance to and mm -hmm. i i felt like that these last couple of months i had other personal stuff going on but i felt like the way that i can get my mind clear is by getting my space clear and i did that at the home and, and office after reading mm -hmm. this so mm -hmm. that was number one number two i found so interesting it says that um when your environment stresses you out and you feel powerless to change anything you'll grab the nearest junk food. So it mm. says here that if you live in a chaotic environment, you are made to feel that you lack self-control and you're more likely to, to wow. binge eat. Wow, that's fascinating. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> um, number three, for obvious reasons, is poor mental health. So let me see. It says here, um, Oh, work satisfaction has pointed to the advantages of employees being able to personalize their surroundings. When those surroundings become cluttered, this may be, they, this may have diminishing returns. So you might feel stressed out about your desk piling up with papers and not having enough mental hygiene to get you through. Mm hmm Right. So we all have we all have bosses in our life that their stuff is is crazy cluttered. Right. Um, and I feel like, what happened? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like who have like books everywhere, papers everywhere. I just I would get stressed walking in people's offices. I remember at my old job, I was walking past a woman's office and it was just stuff everywhere. And I would get stressed looking at it. I'm like, how do you manage in this? How do you get work done? It's, it was just papers and books and boxes and it was overwhelming completely. I, yes, I, I feel like one of my coworkers who I absolutely love, she's like my work wife, her desk is crazy. And I'm always telling her, like, when I work next to her, I'm like, I want to clean your desk. Like, mm -hmm. I cannot work next to you because it's making me anxious. And I've seen it, like, in my own, like, personal life that when I'm all around people and their stuff is cluttered, it makes me anxious because I want to mm -hmm. start cleaning. Right. Um, ooh, this one is really good. So when I was thinking about this podcast and other things that I want to happen in my life, I told myself that I need to get organized and get my space together because how am I going to record my podcast if my stuff is spilling all over the place? Mm -hmm. I don't have space. Mm -hmm. So number four is less efficient, less efficient visual processing. It's hard to see when your surroundings are filled with random stimuli. Hmm. so um they did some kind of study at cornell the so the, they found that the subjects couldn't interpret the emotional expressions on the faces of the characters shown in crowded scenes so this is true in daily life it means that you'll be less accurate in figuring out how people are feeling when you're seeing them amid clutter and i mean yeah. that could be the same thing when you're just trying to focus at work or at home and there's just too much around you that's gonna disturb you right um, and then also lowers creativity. So, um, when you accumulate every gadget, you have no really space to think, um, streamlining, streamlining is just good for housekeeping. It's essential for maintaining happiness at home and at work, and it benefits your physical health and your cognitive abilities. 
So that article I really, really enjoyed. If anybody is interested in wanting to, um, wanting to read about this, I will post it in the show notes. But what do you think of that article, Kim? Yeah, that's amazing. I love how they have like studies to substantiate it too, because I feel like people talk about it in like a personal journey, mm-hmm. but for them to have data or evidence that this lifestyle change can like affect you holistically is really important. So. Yeah, I like that they, I usually don't like when studies focus on the, um, not studies, but I don't like when articles focused on the the negative, but I like in this one that, yes, I had a research, which mm-hmm. I didn't go into a lot of the research because I don't want to bore anybody, even though I like research, and you do too, <laughs> but um, yes, they have evidence to back up what they're saying, and two, they talk about how cluttering is affecting your mental health, instead of saying like, if your space is clean, you'll be happy because right. people like right. don't are not receptive to that. But if you tell mm-hmm. them all the crap that you have in your house is really messing mm-hmm. with your mental health, I feel people mm-hmm. are more receptive to that. Right. Yeah, it's a different way to frame it. I think it's very important. So, so let's get into um, ways that people can minim- minimize or declutter mm-hmm. and how people are probably already doing it. Right. I think that book it should be required reading first because it sounds amazing i haven't read oh, it oh the but- decluttering book <laughs> it's so good. when you were describing it um but i feel like because my decluttering was like less of a method i didn't have a strategy for it it was just more kind of haphazard so i can offer more in terms of like lifestyle changes but like really being self-aware and introspective about your time like mm-hmm. are, is all your time spent other people like dictating your schedule people pleasing trying to be with everybody are you doing things for yourself things that you really find enriching or nourishing and if not you have to kind of begin to take some steps away so i think for the first if in terms of lifestyle changes really doing some self-reflection and introspection about um friendships time energy and Mm-hmm. and it's, it requires courage because it's easy to just do what we've always done and be in the same circles and, and doing the same activities but if it's not beneficial um it might be time to begin to take steps away from that so I think that's the first step is like being self-aware enough to know what is working and what's not working mm-hmm. and a lot of people have trouble with being self-aware would you suggest that maybe to get started they could have some alone time and journal perhaps yeah. I'm a journaler and everybody doesn't find it helpful, but if you're having time, like a hard time with clarity about life and like things feel fuzzy, you're writing things down is always helpful. Like writing lists and like, when am I the happiest? When am I the most stressed? What makes me feel good? Like simple things like that, like writing lists will help you hopefully see some things and patterns in terms of how you spend your time. And again, if all your time is spent, like you're at work all day and you come home and your friends want you to go here and you have to go, like, that's not, a way to live to me that's that feels meaningful so i really you should really be aware of like how do i account for my time in the day is this is is my day for me or is it for other people and can i kind of find balance in that too so yes i second that i think that writing things down makes you like see it and read it and kind of put it into action Mm -hmm. um but it all starts a little bit with having a little alone time little by little and that's why i always advocate to my friends that alone time is important even if if you're a parent if you have a, a partner you should just find those five minutes of mm-hmm. just being by yourself and quiet mm-hmm. and i think i think in that decluttering book i'm pretty sure i read a book and i want to say is that that decluttering book that i was just talking about where she talks about um being alone with no distractions mm-hmm. no tv no music no phone mm-hmm. and she says that being alone with your thoughts i feel like this is something else that i read somewhere else that being alone with your thoughts allows you to work through your thoughts that mm-hmm. when we're constantly stimulated by things like we're like oh i'm just gonna stay here by myself but you're scrolling through social media and you have the tv on mm-hmm. that's not alone time that you should be people who do that are um trying to create noise in their life because they don't want to address the things that are going on and that's what happens when you can't think clearly or see clearly there's some noise like that's cluttering your thoughts Mm -hmm. and you have to figure out are you making the noise like are you creating the noise or is it just things around you Um, yes but like kind of finding silence is really important um it's actually you know i just figured out it's not that book it's another book that i'm gonna look up right now and then um 
what are some ways that we think that people could be minimalist already? Um, I think like how we talked about like thinking more about experiences than mm-hmm. possessions. So like making time to travel with friends or visit friends or doing dinner and just like finding the most value in interactions and yes. that's very that's a very minimalist way where society is like in a materialistic society it's about how much you have and possessions but I feel like we're starting to kind of buck that trend and not see as much worth in that it's not universal but I think that's one thing that's becoming important um and I think also people are finding like different meanings for success like there's more entrepreneurs now and startups yes. and freelancers because people don't want to be conf- confined to like someone else's dream for them or someone else's vision they want to find value in their own way and I think that, that is a minimalist practice too it's like kind of finding what is your purpose what is your calling and living in that even if it's not someone else's vision of success and that being okay um, so I feel like all the self-made people, like now our generation, with even like podcasts, all these small ways people are beginning to tell different stories and mm-hmm. definitely it's like an effort to kind of shed, uh, kind of shed the idea of what success looks like and what a life well lived is, is like too. So I think it's, we're starting to really get away from, it's still like pervasive, but I think we're getting away from it in a way. Right. And I think in... I think that's all valid in that it's also important to point out that everything that Kim just mentioned are all things that are not really difficult to implement. So you might not want to downsize your home. You might not want to live in a tiny house. You may not want to have one pair of black jeans, one pair of blue, one khaki. Like you might not want to do those like tangible things and like throw your stuff away. But what Kim just mentioned and what we've been mentioning about being intentional about your time and your space and your energy mm-hmm. and like those things are just like just general good for your mental mm-hmm. health for health for your health sake yeah for your okay. self care that's like the purest form of self care mm-hmm. is taking time for yourself mm-hmm. and i like that example you know you could be you could decide like you don't i hope that you you guys don't think that you need to all of a sudden become a minimalist cuz we're talking about this no mm-hmm. like what we want you to know is that being a minimalist is not hard. Mm-hmm. There's a lot behind that word, right. but there's a lot of benefits to decluttering your home. There's a mm-hmm. lot of benefits to decluttering your office space. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of benefits to decluttering your um, closet and your life in general. Right. It doesn't really mean that now that you're a minimalist, you're going to have white walls and a black couch, <laughs> like just like a random plant. Like it's not that it's, yeah being intentional about everything around you. I was looking up a list of 25 r- ways that you might be already a minimalist mm-hmm. and they were so ridiculous. Like s- some of the things that are on here are so crazy that I don't think anybody in my life would ever implement, but you don't have to call yourself a minimalist, but if you live a simple lifestyle, that's great. And if that works for you, that's perfect. But if you're looking for a way to minimize your lifestyle or if you feel stressed or you feel anxious you want to declutter you know you can like we you know we just gave you some tips you can mm-hmm. always write you know write me in my email at the mm-hmm. basic latina podcast that i always mention you guys can write us listener letters and there's ways that you can look up decluttering online and you can also read that book that i told you guys mm-hmm. about and i think like the simplest way to frame it is this quote on my phone with like a one it's a list but it's identify the essential and that's really all it is. <laughs> it's identifying the essential, essential yes. in your time, in your schedule, in your friendships, in your workplace. Like, what are the essential things you need? And then eliminate the rest. And that may be too extreme for some people. They may not want to eliminate the rest because that may be like family and friends <laughs> and their job. But if you identify the essential, if nothing else you can do, that is the core of it. Um, and make sure everything you do points to the essential things and not yes, just focus distract. on the essentials. No, distract. What'd you say? No, I said just focus on the essentials. Yeah, identify the essential and then I'm like eliminate the rest. That's kind of where I am. It's like mm-hmm. making sure that the essential things are prioritized and central. Um, and if not, then something might have to be shifted. But I feel like in the simplest way, that's really all it comes down to. So. I, and I feel like that goes back to something. Um, my coworker who I absolutely love another one. I sound like I, I love all my coworkers, but <laughs> one of my other coworkers, she's amazing. And she told me we were actually at APHA this weekend. And I'm just like, Oh, I'm so overwhelmed. 
just so much information. And she was like, just take what you want and leave the rest. Mm-hmm. And it's so, and it's so true. It's so true with like social media and criticism and everything, everything that we're ingesting and that we're saturated with, take what you need right. and leave the rest. Exactly. That's all you have to do. So that's all you, you have to do. It sounds simple, but <laughs> <laughs> and there's definitely going to be better. You get better. Like I was talking to someone today who's applying for my program about my experience. She's like, are you stressed? And I'm like, I'm not stressed at all. And you just have a vision of like a PhD student is going to be like hyper stressed, hyper anxious, overwhelmed. And it's not, it's a choice. You make choices about how you see things, how you frame your experience. Yes. If and you if say you it's going to be terrible, it's going to be terrible. Uh, if you aren't deliberate in like making th- time for things that help you feel so rejuvenated and excited and, and, and you know, enjoyable, you will be stressed. But I think that you can be deliberate about your time and your perspective. Your perspective is powerful, you know? So, so much of it is how we see things and how we choose to see them. But for me, I refuse to like die young trying to become a PhD. Like I don't care that much, <laughs> you know? Like... Right. My purpose of my work is not in my achievements or my accolades. It's in my friendships. It's in my, the difference I'm making in people's lives and the impressions I leave, you know? So I feel like the more you can minimize what is important and have a lens on that, you just feel a lot freer when you're not so bound by all these standards and expectations and requirements. So, yeah. And you know what? I think that is an amazing way to end this in that you have to when you are kind of figuring out what's important to you and minimizing your, your lifestyle and, you know, figuring out what the essentials are, you are going to get people in your life who are going to be supportive. Mm -hmm. And some people in your life who are just not going to be supportive of what you, you know, in anything, but it's how you frame things and how you think about things that are going to make a difference because it's your life. So if Kim would have said to that guy, like, Oh my God, getting my PhD is terrible and I hate it. Right. That's your narrative. That's your mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. Right. But for example, this happened to me. You have to, you have to take control of how you see your life and stop letting people write it for you. Mm-hmm. The same thing with, I was telling one of my coworkers yesterday about how I want to go back to school for my MPH. And she was like, Oh, you're going to hate it. And I was like, no, I won't. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. so it's like, we have to get better at, telling people like, no, 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 that's not you. No, that's not my story. That's your, that's your version of the story. So fine. There's no shame, but that's not my experience and and be fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Girl, uh, this was such an amazing conversation. I do want to point out one book when I was talking about being alone with your thoughts and not having Mm -hmm. any distractions that actually came from the book. Um, her, her name is Amy Morin. She's an LCSW. So she's a licensed clinical social worker. She has a book that I absolutely love that I like tore up. It's called 13 Things. I came and talk. 13 <laughs> Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. Taking mm-hmm. back your power, embrace change, face your fears, and train your brain for happiness and success. Awesome. For those of you who follow me on social media, you know I'm always trying to advocate for a self-help book. And believe me, like three years ago, you would have never caught me reading a self-help book. But mm-hmm. With everything that I've gone through the past year, I realized that, you know, there are a lot of different ways for me to cope with diff- with, my, with my stressors. And so mm-hmm. this book has helped me a lot in terms of other books too. But this one touches upon minimalism, putting purpose into your life. She really goes through like 13 things that mentally strong people don't do and all the mm-hmm. mistakes that we make in our daily life. And she will like snatch your edges. <laughs> she will so I, I'm gonna put that in the show notes as well um oh I, f- I almost forgot Kim I have to ask you my my rapid fire questions oh great <laughs> <laughs> questions that I ask all my guests okay. they're not I say rapid fire but there's nothing fast about them okay. like, so first one is what are you listening to right now uh Daniel Caesar and Moses Sumney <gasps> oh, I love his whole album. It's so good. Isn't he like a baby? Daniel Caesar? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure how old he is. I feel like he's like Khalid where like they're like 18 or maybe I not. I don't think he's that young, but he's probably like early 20s. Okay. Yeah. Love him. Love that. Support that. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> what are you reading right now other than school? <laughs> <Nothing>. <laughs> I did actually read Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown. That was great. Um, I'm not into like too much self-help either 
I usually read fiction, but other than schoolwork, I'm actually not reading. Is Benet Brown good? Because she's on my list. Um, it's kind of basic. I mean, okay. I feel like this is bad. I mean, hello, we are the basic Latina podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's things that, I, because I, and honestly, because I've been becoming a minimalist, I think the things in the book were like repetitive for me because I've been trying to adopt a lot of the practices already. So okay. for some reason, it could be a good read for someone who was trying to like shed some of some bad habits, but I think I'm at a point where I've, I'm getting much better. So it wasn't so transformative for me, but it was interesting. So. I love that. Thank you for letting me know because I have a whole bunch of her books that I want to read. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and they're easy reads. So they're not like they're going to take you, you know, 20 years to finish, but they're, they're like inspiring, I would say. That's awesome. Yeah. What is your morning routine like, Kim, to get you ready for the day and rejuvenate it? So I wake up around six. I read the Bible. I journal. No. I water <laughs> and then I usually start the day I exercise but usually I'll do homework and then exercise to kind of break up the morning but reading the bible and journaling is my first two things on my list so yeah I love that bible and journaling or do you have right bible and journaling mm -hmm. okay and then what's your nightly routine because that's bad I really I've been trying to like find something better for myself because I'm trying to go to bed by 10 so I can get up at 6 so I keep saying I'm going to have 9 to 10 be like my wind down time. And oh, wind yeah. down mm -hmm. should be like reading a book or like sitting looking at the wall. But I'm like on social media. But that's not winding down. That's like I'm over here like. No, we're the, we're the worst. Yeah. Us. So I need to get better. But for now, it's just a, it's in a one hour block at least where I'm not doing anything besides social media, which is not relaxing. But, you know, I'll get better <laughs> someday. Girl, we could, we could always do something to get better. <laughs> What has made you the happiest this week? Um, so this week, Nashville had a Black Entrepreneurship Week, which was amazing. So mm -hmm. I think I was happy just seeing Black excellence and people really thinking about how to empower their communities through economics. So that was really inspiring. They had events all week. Mm -hmm. And I hear amazing stories and meet incredible people. So it was inspiring just to see... Um, what's happening in the smaller city, but it can really have like a large impact on community. So that was great. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. And what do you do for self care? Um, journaling is very important. Um, shopping, even though I'm trying to be minimalist. <laughs> <laughs> Sporadic shopping. Um, taking care of my plants is actually very calming. That's oh, I love, yes, but there's so much research about plant therapy. It's so good. I love it. Um, time with friends is actually very therapeutic, which is why I'm so particular about who I spend time with, because if I want to be refreshed by you, like, you need to be bringing positive energy to, to the conversation. Mm. That's really big for me. Um, music is huge, so going to see live shows and listening to new artists is really helpful, so... Those basic things, but I try to not get to the point where I'm hyper stressed, where I have to like do all these things to come down. I try to keep my stress levels low, and if they're yeah. off, like quickly. Oh, they kind of you trying to manage your stress so you don't have to tap in. Yeah, because then if I'm too stressed, trying to come down from that is hard for me. So if I'm feeling myself getting worked up, I'm immediately like, okay, calm down, like do something, <laughs> you know, switch it for schedule, because if not, it's hard to unwind from that. Yeah. That's so true. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much, Kim. How, do, you, do you feel like this was therapeutic? And yeah, I love it. It's, it's amazing seeing my journey from the year. Because I'm such a different person, I think, because of my minimalist ways and just experience mm -hmm. I've had where I just don't feel this, like the same person. Like, we were reading an article for the class that I TA for about perfectionism and rumination and worry, and I was like, I don't really feel like this anymore, <laughs> you know? There you I'm go. I'm very driven, very motivated, but I just have a different perspective of what matters. So the things that would have stressed me or consumed me six months ago, I'm just, I, I'm like past, you know? And it's not yeah. like I'm free from those issues, but I just, I don't see myself the same way that I did um, even six months ago, honestly. So it's like, I'm really grateful that I had the explosion of minimalism before school and before this really big transition in my life. And I can now live a lot of a more mellow, like peaceful, calm life than I would have. Mm -hmm. I, I love that, Kim, because you get to reflect on your life. And I'm trying to be at that point where I'm as mellow as you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know what? This podcast is on my way there because I feel like I journal a lot. I journal a lot. And I've mentioned this in all my episodes and that I'm just tired of people writing my narrative for me. And for so long, I just felt like suffocated. And this is kind of my way to be free. And my mantra for chapter 28 is um, to not live in fear and be fearless. Mm -hmm. And this is my way of not being fearless. Mm Because believe me, there's a lot of anxiety around me being so candid on this podcast Mm -hmm. and stuff. But I just have, you know, I have to realize that I do have a platform and I want to highlight certain things that are important. Mm -hmm. And this is my way. So we'll, we'll see. We're on this journey together. For sure. Oh, so thank you guys so much for listening to the Basic Latina Podcast. You can find us on iTunes and Spotify at Basic Latina Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to rate re- and review us because the more reviews we get, the more visibility we get and visibility is essential. The Basic Latina Podcast inbox is open. So please email me your comments, suggestions, or questions at basic latina podcast at gmail.com we intend to do a listener letter episode later in the season so please send me your letters and a guest host and i will answer them for you i would like to thank the pod squad for making basic latina podcast sound so good editorial oversight is by gabby barnes my intern is elizabeth lopez and my music is by michael i'll see you guys next week and thank you guys thank you kim so much for being on it welcome thanks for having me of course and good luck so much with school and i'll talk to you guys soon